I had to kill a lot of parts of myself that were like yeah. animalistic in the hunter. I had to kill a lot because as you, you're probably similar as you were saying, I couldn't really be in a closed environment with an attractive young woman without like physically getting <laughs> seriously, like physically yeah. getting like feeding time, you yeah. know, like almost like the equivalent of salivating. Like I'm going to, I'm going to get a piece of this. Like you can feel it in your, that's probably why you're laughing because you identify. Uh, welcome guys. We've got uh, Paul Jenka, New York city day game legend, officially or unofficially on the call. Uh, he's, you're living in London now. Yeah. North London. Yeah. I've been here since 2011. Okay. But you're from, uh, are you from New Santa York? Monica, California. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. You told me that. Yeah. Yeah. Santa Monica. Okay. When did you move to New York? It was, was that, uh, Oh, my, 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 my general movement, sorry, was born and raised in Santa Monica till 18. And then I went to college. I was in Boston for college and I started business there for nine years. And then in 2002, right after 9-11, I moved to New York and lived there for nine years. And then I met my wife there, my now wife, and started coming to London because we were dating. Uh, and I, I liked it. So then I moved here in 2011. I've been here ever since. Yeah, I was mentioning to you before uh, before you got on the call that I lived in England for about a year for graduate school. That was one of my favorite places as well. It's a huge melting pot. It's, Very like, it's, ex it's well. expensive though, right? If you live in the main zones. It's, the pound has taken a bit of a beating, but yeah, I mean, especially when I first moved here, London is yet. It, for a while, actually, after the crisis, because mm -hmm. basically the U.S. dropped in, uh, interest rates really quickly in response but England held on, so there was a huge disparity in their currency, strength of their currency. There was a point, I think 2008 or something, where it was $2 to one British pound. Yep. I was, so I was living there in 2006 and 2007. And I remember like the numeric amounts compared to the US were the same, but my money was worth half as much. <laughs> then if you live in that way, then you're like, fuck, it is very expensive now. Yeah. And still London is, I mean, property, and so it's an expensive city for sure. Nice. So let me let me jump into I, I uh, prepared some questions for you. So yeah, so your bio, your your background, you kind of so you I wanted to point out you went to to Harvard, which is impressive for mm. uh, for physics. Yeah, and I'm like a, a bit of a. So you were were you pretty nerdy back in the day or what? Nerdy? I don't know. I mean, I never I never would have looked or been described as a nerd, but I I'm pretty intellectual, and actually yeah. today I'm still pretty academic. I. I teach GMAT and GRE. I mean, I like puzzles. I like thinking critically about language or math. Um, and I don't like, stu I don't, I'm not stupid. So in other words, yeah. if, that's the, if that's the choice between stupid well, it's, and it's, it's interesting to me because I, I took a very analytical approach to game. Like I, I basically formed a system that I treated like a scientific method. So I was always constantly analyzing, looking for the weak spots, trying to find guys that are better than me in any area. And then evolving and optimizing it. So, do you do you view like pickup and, and seduction stuff as like a skill game? Like, do you is that how you look? In at it, it? Inadvertently, actually, the way I made my name in this, which was also quite inadvertent, I I was running around New York in my early late twenties, early thirties with another guy who was very neurotic about detail. He 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 could have been a an incredible entrepreneur. In fact, his father was, mm -hmm. but he was sort of a ne'er do well. He didn't really. He didn't really make the most of it, but he loved to bang chicks. So he used his like prodigious uh, analytic skills, and I have those too, on uh, optimizing this thing. And it, yeah. it, I don't think we would have known it at the time, but what happened was we used to, he lived across Central Park from me, and we, we used to have like separately, like a couple dates in a night, for example. And then maybe we'd bang the chick or not, and she would, and then at like 2 or 3 a.m., I'd usually get on the phone with him and we'd, eat hummus and chips and like kind of uh, <laughs> de debrief on the dates. Yeah. And he'd be like, all right, so five minute in, five minutes in, did you walk out and dim the lights? Or like, did you have can't? In other words, we went through the whole scenario over years yep. and like analyze every detail. That's yeah. And, that's Well, cool. that's the same way I look at it. <laughs> and then I basically, when I wrote my book attraction for him, I just took what I knew worked. And it's very true that you can small details, over a large data set, it will make a difference. And then I had a spreadsheet so I could kind of analyze. So yes, the answer is yes. I mean, I'm analytic. So I looked at this and I was like, you know what? I'm actually wasting time because it's so frustrating when you have a girl who's ready to bang. Like this yeah. is what truth of me in my twenties, like really attractive women. I remember that you mentioned Latinos, like this one half 
Puerto Rican, half no, half Dominican, half Italian girl. I mean, she was, a, and she wanted to go. And I, <laughs> I misread the cues and I fucked the whole thing up. And I was like, yeah. "There's nothing more annoying to a guy when you when you miss a, a layup." And yep. she, and then you're like, "Oh my god, if I had just done X instead of Y, I would have been bank." And so enough of those things happen where I was like, you know what? I better fucking get my head screwed on straight on this. Okay, so Paul, tell us about the the course, the the link, or where, how they can find out more about the new offering you have. Yeah, the new offering is called No Man Left Behind. You click on the link below or it's nomanleftbehind.teachable.com. And uh, I have, there's two courses in there. There's uh, Playboy to Papa, which will teach you everything you need to know from meeting and dating tons of girls all the way to selecting and screening for a wife and how to screen, her, how to meet her, how to screen her, how to keep her. And then I have another uh, class in that same offering called DNT Clinic. It's what we talked about, decision note theory. And I run a clinic for a select group of guys, and we work together for a year on basically we examine your game under a microscope, where you're going wrong, why it's not working. So Awesome. So, guys, check that out in the link below. Make sure you click that. Take a look at, at Paul's offering. And, so and that, this was okay. so when you guys were doing this this analysis. Was this back? You, you said 2002 was when you. This was 2005 to. I mean, when I really hit the, well, I moved to New York in 2002, but I, and I was already banging a lot of chicks. But when I got serious about sort of thinking about it analytically, it was probably I wrote Getting Laid in NYC, mm -hmm. which was my first kind of thing on this in 2005. So. That was, was that that was the year that the game came out, right? Or, or a year or two? Yeah, later? it's funny enough. I, I wrote that thing and I was I was already a bit of a playboy. I was running around New York and then someone read that and said, Oh, you should read this book, The Game, which I did. But I thought it was quite fluffy and it was an in, fun little I read it in yeah, yeah, but it didn't have any technical skills. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, guys are always like, Oh, I need to read the book The Game to get good at this. But yeah, it's more really of like an entertaining people. story. Whereas like my, my big foray into the whole technical aspect of it was mystery method. Did you, did you read that I've ever? I've heard of it. No, I, did yeah. you, do you give it credence? You think it's good? Yeah, I, I actually uh, slept in my first 100 before ever. It was just through mystery method. The guy was just supplying his stuff. But you also and, said before we started, you do nightclubs and stuff, night stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We was, can, I, did we, the, I didn't do that as much. Yeah, yeah. We can get, we can get into the, the differences. Um, okay, so I'm curious. Uh, what, what's like the basic outline of your method that you used to use? Uh, I mean, we're going, I'm 43 years old now, married with the yeah. kids, so we're going way back. But, um, basically it's a, it's like a funnel, like a sales funnel. You get a, a, you got to get good at the pickup and be, there's a lot of steps there and, um, you, you know, get a lot of numbers, charm the girls and then text them and some percentage flows through and then have a really tight game on terms of the e either meet her at a lounge for a drink and that's got to be tight or at my peak I cut all that shit out and it was like just text her to the door and yeah, then, yeah and then some fraction will come up and some won't and you just that's, cut the losses that's, that's the exact same progression that I went through I'm glad you, I'm glad you said sales funnel too because that's how I describe it in my videos I say like you have your lead acquisition which is the pickup stuff that puts a whole bunch of numbers into the funnel and then your lead management which is your texting and your ability to schedule dates, reschedule, deal with flaking, deal with shifting the girls around, you know, scheduling your rotation, and then the lead closing. So those are like the three big components. And I, like I CRM actually, software. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I started like a year and a half ago cutting out the, not completely, but I started trying to, as a first priority, bringing them straight to the house. And I, I, I've developed like a pretty good method for that. Um, I'll, go, I'll go into that really fast and see what, what your thoughts are in terms of your data. Basically, like, so I have her on text. I find out when she's free. We set up a day and time for the date. And then I say, do you like wine? So I'm, like, building, like, a small compliance letter. She usually says yes, like, 90, 90 95% of the time. And then I say, cool, we could split a bottle of wine in my new flat, my new apartment. Um, smiley face, do you prefer red or white? So it's, like, a sales decision close. And out of, like, 10 chicks, assuming that 10 chicks that would want to meet up with you in the first place, not just 10 random numbers, about five I've found, and this is off tons of data and with other advanced guys too, about five will just say red or they'll say white and I'll say, okay, sounds good. See you whatever day and time. The other five will give some kind of safety objection or some kind of I'd prefer to meet in public. Um, I don't meet strangers, their house. What if you're a serial killer? You know, I, you know, let's meet at a bar first and see how that goes. And with those five, I found, I, I split tested a whole bunch of stuff again, like being scientific. And I found the text that works the best is to say, LOL, I'm really laid back, don't worry. 
bring pepper spray if you're that worried LMAO. And I don't ever type LMAO in normal texting, but it's, it just kind of like takes a whole bunch of the buying pressure off. And the chick's like, okay, like, and I, I add in too, I tell guys, like, if you have security in your building or like anything like that, like in my current building, I have a security desk and a, a chick just came over a couple of days ago and I said, you know, there's security in the building. Ha ha ha. There's no worries. And it's just mo mostly a safety objection, but they also don't want to feel too slutty about it either. So if I, if I feel it's like a big thing where they don't want to feel slutty about it, I'll say, don't worry, I'm not expecting sex. And that converts like two to three out of those five, which, so now you've got seven to eight of them out of those 10 coming to the house. And obviously that saves money on dates. It saves time. It increases the chances that you'll close. And then, I mean, it, you know, the whole thing's just, the frame is just much stronger. And then out of those two to three that still insist on meeting in public, I've done those dates and taken that data as well, like a fucking, you know, data analyst with this shit. And <laughs> a lot of times those girls won't come home with you. And a lot of times if they do come home, they won't hook up. So it's, it's almost like a sexual screen as well. So what I tell guys is like, you know, if you're, if you're new to this or you're inter intermediate or whatever, a lot of times you're going to have to do the public date. You, you need to get your skills for running dates good you know even if they get the chick to the house oftentimes they're not going to close if they are more new to this but my general rule is if the chick's like hot enough if it's like eight to eight five out of ten range i'll still do the public date and like some i know that there's a category of girls that just have a hard rule that they won't come home with a guy on the first date and some of them you just need to put in like two to three to four dates which i don't have a problem with i know a lot of coaches that they have a, a hard rule like if she doesn't put on the first date they won't see her again but some of the best ones make you wait a few days so is that similar to what you were doing or how, how are you getting chicks to the house yeah no that sounds spot on i mean a, you know a lot of this stuff this was well how long ago was this 2005 or 15 years ago almost so you know in terms of people were texting and all that but um i i i'm just thinking back a lot of things resonated like first of all girls would come to the door Usually what I would do is when I at sort of my peak, when I cut out the lounge, although the lounge converted really well, but the problem is, of course, like you always will lose some percentage at the transition from the lounge to your house. Yeah, yeah. It's all about transition. <laughs> the more transition points you have, there's an attrition rate at each transition point, right? I'm glad so, you're talking like my exact language. So this is cool. And um, it's funny. I didn't really, I didn't go into it so cutthroat or analytic but i just i was dating so much that i i the data was staring me in the face i couldn't ignore it that's how this evolved but girls would so what i started to do is i'd say hey just meet me i lived in a very tony neighborhood of manhattan 68th and madison very fancy and I, I i would say just meet me at 68th and madison i know a great little spot nearby and so they'd come to the door and then i'd say buzz up and so <clears throat> what would usually happen is sometimes they would i would just buzz them and they'd come up so not I learned this from my buddy Jeff. Sometimes I go down with my shirt open or like slippers on and be like, I'm not quite ready. So obviously I can't leave the building with slippers on. So I'd say, I got to pop back up. And so they would sometimes follow me. And then I would get the objection, are you an act? And I, I instead of pepper spray, I'd often say like, you know, I left my ax upstate or something. Like, <laughs> are you an ax murderer? Sometimes they would yeah, even yeah. say stuff like that. Like, are you sick? <laughs> I'd say, no, no, my ax is upstate. Don't worry. So I'd make it like you did. I made a joke of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of these guys, I mean, there are crazy people out there, but usually it's just really horny guys that want to shortcut it to sex. It's not so much that their physical safety is in, in, in question. And then, um, but I had exactly the same experience. The, the, those 20% of the girls or 10% that are a stick in the mud, I find that they, if they're problematic at the door, they're going to be problematic throughout the whole circuit. And yeah. I even write that in my book. I say, difficult women remain difficult. I just, when I was in the thick of it, I was so close to the data. I just knew that if a girl wouldn't come up or was, or was being a pain in the ass, like there was no point in conceding to her because I'd go spend money and do it. And she wouldn't reward me by coming up. She'd say no at the end yeah, I knew yeah. that from experience. So uh -huh. I got pretty brutal at the end where it was, we used to have these like full on detente on the front door. And I'd be like, well, sorry, you showed up. I guess. It doesn't look like it's going to work out. And I just slammed the door in her face. And I, but I usually triple booked. So I had two more dates you know, coming because I would stagger it. I used to I do, do the like 730, 930, 10, or 739, 1015 or something in New York. So I could be pretty bullshit on each because I always had backup. That was the key. Yep. And um, 
the funny thing is women respond to hard terms so well. I remember this hot Indian girl that I met at SOAS, really hot in, in, in white jeans. She came up, and I wanted to fuck her so bad. She looked so good. She would not come up. And I was like, well, it looks like we you just wasted your time. I was kind of an asshole. And I slammed the door, closed the door. And then she left, and she texted me the next day. She said, fuck it, I'll come over. And she just she was so turned on by my terms. <laughs> and she just took a taxi and came, and I just fucked her all night. And then I took yeah. her out for something to eat afterward, and I fucked her in a bush in front of a corporate building. <laughs> crazy. No, I guess, anyhow, the point is, like, I – the most powerful a guy who's really on top of his game if he's unyielding women uh -huh. feel that he yep. they know that he has abundance behind that they're like well he's not going to fuck me but I, and that turns him on so they'll come back yeah because most most guys aren't willing to do that they capitulate yeah that's the worst thing you can do it's like yeah the guys are like you know pretend to have this boundary and then at the end of the day they're like oh well, i'm still going to try to fuck her or whatever and they're going to just cave and mm -hmm. she knows that yeah I've, I've had the same experience when you put down the hard line and you know if they don't get in line with that yeah, whatever you got more girls so. exactly yeah so to, just to touch on uh, the triple booking stuff so yeah i usually i usually set for the nighttime slots i set like a 7 p.m and then i do you you were saying you, it sounded like you do like an hour and a half in between so if you're doing dates to the house you can make it less yeah it's about like an hour and a half hour to hour and a half if you're doing the date in public i usually leave two and a half hours because sometimes the date can my date sweet spot was usually 45 to 75 minutes is that yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, some guys, yeah. some guys will spend two, three hours at the <laughs> at the venue. At the venue, I think but... as you as you as you start living this lifestyle more and more, you become very efficient and a bit ruthless because yeah. I'm not saying it's mentally healthy, but we you turn like at my <laughs> peak, I was a bit pathological in that it was like the the shortest line to the pussy, so I was really yeah. an operator. Yeah, and I cut out all the superfluous stuff, which is exciting. It's quite thrilling, you know, and 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 basically you're. You're trying to go meet girls and convert them as fast as possible, and it's yep. almost like a what's well, it? Optimization. It's a, game. It's a sport. Um, so yeah, they, they, there's all these tactics, and if you're a smart guy like you are or I was, you know, you figure out how to game it pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what was so thrilling for me is as you make these key tweaks, like once once you hit that epiphany where you're like you don't even need to do the public date, now you just have like a almost like a conveyor belt of chicks on the way. And if you have, like, my whole thing, I'll, I'll give you more insight into mine because I'm curious how you're doing it or how you were doing it. Um, I'm always putting out the whole frame and impression that I'm working, like, round the clock, okay? which, which translates into I'm seeing all these other chicks at those times, but they think I'm always busy with work. So that allows me to, like, move up time slots or, or make the time slot later based on how a particular date is going. So, like, a chick won't come back to the house. I can hit up the, you know, if I see it's not going to go down, I hit up the next one. Hey, I just finished my meetings. Can you meet earlier? Yeah, sure, that's good. Or, or with the, you know, the chicks taking too long. Hey, I got stuck on a work meeting. Or I'll even cancel on them with that excuse. Hey, we, you know, we're on this big meeting. We're going to close a big deal. And they can't really blame you for that. Because if, even if they try to blame me, I'll say, oh, well, this is a big contract for work. Like, you want me to just tell everybody to fuck off? Or, you know, what are you, what are you expecting? And I kind of have what, I, what I've referred to in videos as like a floater spot as well where I tell a particular chick, like, I can meet sometime during the night, but I'm not sure, like, what's going to happen with my meetings. And then if some girl cancels or, or just disappears or whatever, boom. You I call set her that. off the bench. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, there's, and there's, like, rotation chicks where you can just hit them up. So, so what was, like, the size of the, the rotations that you were juggling on average? What do you mean? How many girls? Like, uh, in terms of the regulars. I don't know. I would say I probably had... I usually had, when I think back to sort of my real sweet spot, I probably had two two sweethearts that I quite liked, that we had good chemistry. I'd see them periodically. Mm -hmm. That was almost girlfriend status, but not enough that they asked questions. But yeah, yeah I, call, like, I call that like a main chick. It's, it's almost like the girl, a girlfriend without the label. Mm -hmm. awesome. Then there were probably another like four or five that we had great chemistry, but I wasn't interested in any part of their life except banging them. Yeah. We, we wouldn't we wouldn't necessarily go ever to a movie or anything like that and then there were so those were sort of yeah. the solid bench and then there were probably i was constantly harvesting new girls so there was yeah. always the at my peak there were probably one or two or maybe three new girls a week or something yeah, yeah. so that was sort of it i mean sometimes as i'm sure you you can have these moments where it's really 
really saturated and like, it slows oh, down. Oh yeah, or whatever. I get, yeah, it gets to be, it gets to be a headache. Like I, I always tell guys, like I and I devote a shitload of time to this. So I'm I'm usually running like six to twelve regulars, but there's like you said, like one to two. It's like the hottest ones you have the best chemistry with, and you're you know you're doing dinners and different types of boyfriend girlfriend shit with them. You know you have an emotional connection to them without the the label, and you know, but once you once you get up like in Poland, I was running sixteen regulars, and it it just got. Are to you be, in Warsaw? Or what? Yeah, so it's a big city though. Huh? Yeah, yeah, but it, it just got to be like way too overwhelming because because what what ended up happening was I was always having to cancel on chicks because I was I was going on new dates as well while seeing sixteen regulars, and so it was like, you know, just there, there's not enough time in the day, and. So between all the canceling and, and having to constantly reschedule them and stuff, like sometimes they start to get pissed and, and some of them like want a whole bunch of your attention. Like I had one chick literally say like, you know, I want to see you on the weekends. You tell me you're always out with your guy friends because that's when I'd be hitting the club is on, on Friday and Saturday or I'd be spending the, the, the night with like the best ones, the top two for like a sleepover or something. But some of them like start to demand so much time that it's just, it's like unrealistic. I don't know. So that's when... I'd be cutting chicks out, but it, it's what's cool in Warsaw is um, like there were chicks on rotation from Ukraine, from Croatia, Lithuania, uh, Belarus. You know, you're getting that nice mix of the Eastern Europe. Most of them were Polish, but you're also getting those. But are they coming? They come into town, or are they just happen to be living in? Poland? No, they're li- they're just living. Yeah, you know, I'm t- when I talk about the regulars, like they're they're chicks that are living here. A bunch of them move, move here for work or whatever, like you because in Ukraine. I never they're... thought. I sometimes think of Poland. I'm probably, but I. Obviously, because it's quite a good quality of life for mm-hmm. you know, less expensive than, let's say, other Western European. So obviously, there's a lot of women from the surrounding countries that work and live there too. Yep. So you're not just restricted to Polish chicks. You got Romanian and Ukraine. I didn't, I didn't actually connect the dots on that. Yeah, great. The only, yeah, the only problem though is they might. I, I, I love it overall. Just the chicks are just feminine and elegant, and you know they're not overrun by the feminism and, and Me Too stuff that's happening in the Western cultures. And you know, like the reversal of roles where the chicks are becoming more masculine and the, the dudes are becoming more feminine. But um, my big complaint is just the lack of racial variety. Like it's really rare to meet a Latina or like any like non-white, for instance. So I do I do oh, miss yeah. that. But you know, it, it makes up for itself with the chicks being cool internally and most of them being hotter and a lot less overweight than than Western cultures. So cool. Yeah. But I'm, I'm curious. Well, it sounds like you're at a sort of, you're in the sweet spot. You've optimized all this. You're running. I mean, everything is sort of. You're in the con- cockpit here, like controlling yeah. all. Very cool. Yeah. The question for me, because I'm older and I've opted, you know, got off the merry-go-round, is what, what do you, um, what do you, how long you think you'll run in that mode? And you're 35. You said like, is this? Yeah. Obviously, guys can have sex until they're 80. I mean, is this a 40-year plan, or do you think? There'll be a shift at some point. We were, we were talking before we started recording. We were talking about the singularity stuff. I, I think we're going to be like virtual sex is going to burst onto the scene probably in the next decade, um, just from the advances. Well, how does that you? How does that work? A guy puts his dick in like a sleeve, and there's a girl on hologram, or what is it? <laughs> no, that? no, it'll it'll be uh, nanobots replace. This is like super nerdy talk, but it'll be nanobots replacing your sensory inputs. So like. Oh, okay. you know, so you'll feel, feel like, like a, she's massaging you or whatever. It'll feel like real, like what what you're experiencing in real life, but it, you'll have like on demand access to tens and stuff like that. So, I think cold approach and and all that stuff's going to kind of fall by the wayside, and we're going to have these massive paradigm shifts. So, I don't I don't plan to get married. That could change, but I don't plan to. I I'm just too worried. I would I would uh, fuck it all up. Like I've I've had situations where I've had like the nine five or even close to ten uh, girlfriend. And I like do all the steps to like prevent the cheating. I like delete Tinder. I'll stop going out to the bars and clubs. I'll stop doing cold approaches. And like with one example, like in Puerto Rico, this chick was a lingerie model. She was on the billboards and stuff in San Juan. And she was actually, she was half Italian, half Puerto Rican. That's funny you said the half Dominican, half Italian. It's like a nice mix. They've got like the, the elegance and also the body. And she was like full package. And I, you know, I had a hot chick next to me on the plane. And I banged her. I had a hot Uber driver and I banged her. Like th- this girlfriend couldn't come to the holiday party. I ended up having a threesome with these two chicks in my building at the holiday party. And it's like, I wasn't even trying. It was, it was like, you just know, once you develop this skill, you know what to do, you know what to say, you know the steps to take. 
And it's hard to just like turn the switch off. At least mm. I don't know. Yeah, of course. Yeah. How have you? How have you? I'm curious. How have you like resisted? Like, uh, I mean, your old lifestyle. Now that you're doing family, like you're in the family life, like how do you? How do you like? Yeah, turn it's a hard, very hard transition. I mean, that kind of lifestyle is quite addictive, you know. And you can kind oh, of yeah. get, you can kind of get in a a rabbit hole with it. And mm. I guess I there was a big part of me that always I never um rejected family life or I I never said I'm not gonna I mean I always assumed I'd be married with kids I mean despite my playboy years I kind of always thought I would have a sort of a normal life when I was older quote unquote yeah. normal. when did you uh, out of curiosity what age did you get married 40 as I saw myself getting more and more like deeply sucked into this I was a little concerned about like am I ever going to be able to get out of this like mindset as you say it can be quite and um, so I, I, I did. I met a. I identify. I was also getting a bit tired of it. Like I, I, I wrote and I wrote a. You know, David Letterman does top ten. I wrote a top ten reasons to get out of the game, because there are some. There's a number of things for me that were taking their toll, like lack of sleep. Oh yeah. And, and STDs. I mean, there's a handful of stuff like and sleeping with strangers. I remember this one hot. I think she was Colombian. Or, or was she Swedish ballerina? I don't know, with great tits. And, and <laughs> she slept, came and slept over. We banged, and she's in my old flat. And I had, I was making quite a bit of money then. I had like laptops and cash around. And I remember. <clears throat> she stole shit? Stuff. What? She stole shit? Or she what? didn't. But I remember she, we were like getting ready for bed, and she was, um, I'm like dozing off, and, and I, I wake up, and she has her eyes wide open. I'm like, what's up? And she's like, oh, I'm an insomniac. I'll just lie here. <laughs> and I, I was like saying, I was like, I had just met this girl and I'm like, she, she didn't see anything. She left it. But I was just thinking like, it's only a matter of time till fucking that creeped me out a little bit. Like mm -hmm. basically all these strangers were in my house all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, I wrote this top 10 thing and I, I looked at it quite objectively, like surreal, like I have to get out of this lifestyle. <clears throat> and so it was a hard transition, but I had a hard, pretty hard line in the sand for myself. I knew what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I met this girl and I shifted gears and I courted her hard who's now my wife and um the first few years of domestic life I'm you know I still would look at girls and I still felt kind of like a caged animal but the truth is as you get older your libido if you're in a relationship your libido will decline and um you know I had to I had to kill a lot of parts of myself that were like animalistic and the hunter I had to kill a lot because as you you're probably similar as you were saying I couldn't really be in a closed environment with an attractive young woman without like physically getting <laughs> seriously, like physically yeah. getting like feeding time, you yeah. know, like almost like the equivalent of salivating. Like I'm going to, I'm going to get a piece of this. Like you can <laughs> feel it in your, that's probably why you're laughing because you identify, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I had to kill a lot of that because you can't be like that. And like, it sucks. It sucks too. Cause like at the, at the same time, like <laughs> it's not like you're either like a player or, or you're a relationship dude. Like, I would still be like I was like in love with that chick, and I really cared about her. I didn't want to hurt her, and but at the same time, like I'm, I'm a man that's attracted to hot chicks, and it's hard to reconcile the two, and it's hard. It's hard to, you know, I, I never wanted to hurt that chick or, or do anything bad to her, but it, it's easy to be impulsive sometimes when, you know, like you're you're just having a conversation with a hot chick, and she's, you know, super attracted to the whole thing, and you're like, well, you know, I got to be the. <coughs> Yeah, it's a big, it's a big thing. And I guess for me, it was, I really wanted to make the transition. So I put in the discipline and I changed my behavior and I had to kill a lot of my instincts, you know, mm -hmm. which is, I'm happy where I am now, but it was, a, it's a process because as you become a, a well-oiled machine, you know, yep. so a lot of friends of mine who, who didn't opt to make family or whatever, they're still on that course and they're 43 and 44. And I, um, Obviously, you can keep doing it. I don't know if you know Tom Torero and yeah, I've heard uh, of those guys. He's a London day gamer as well, right? Yeah, and um, and Troy Francis and those guys. But I just wonder. For me, it was kind of also. I didn't want the lifestyle necessarily of an eight older bachelor. I wanted yeah. to be a family man. So, I mean, but there's nowadays there's communities and men can you, you can kind of live that life longer. So. Cool. All right. So yeah, so we're limited on time. I'll, I'll just run through some of these other questions here. <laughs> So in, term, in terms of stats, like for, for my personal stats, like around the time that I hit a thousand chicks, I looked in the, the contacts in the phone and it, it was just a little bit over 10,000. So 
And those you, are mostly. Yeah, that, I mean, that's crazy. You've slept with a thousand girls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had I had that in December, but I but that, I've been. That's amazing. I've been. Uh, it's like I've like traded my life away for it. And it's like it's basically all I've been doing for the past. I, my friends are all like, dude, you could have. Because I, I used to be involved with like quantitative technical analysis with day trading stocks and hedge funds and stuff like this, and I used to. Um, I don't know. I, I've been involved in a bunch of entrepreneurial projects where I, I think I, if, if I would have directed the focus there instead, I could have done a lot of other great shit. I just, I, it, the, what produced these results is basically just a hyper analytical mind and just continuous optimization. Like and I, focus, I mastered, as you said, you're very focused on it. Here's a question I, and for I, and you. I had a very, I had a very verbally abusive childhood, which I found a lot of the top guys had like a rough. Did you go through any of that or a ch bad childhood or? I mean, I had, there were some moments, I mean, my childhood had some, some dark moments and it was, you know, I don't know, verbally abusive. No, but I could see how women would respond to that. If you've internalized that. And for, for me, it was like, my mother was always like, you're nothing. Like you're never going to be anything like this. Even when I got really into philosophy, she's like, that's just for deadbeats, that kind of stuff. And I think like my adult life combined with the hyper analytical mind has just been this, you know, relentless pursuit for more and more external validation which isn't healthy at all <laughs> well, let me ask you this question um i mean it's great that you can acknowledge that is a thousand i've only slept with about 250 girls so i mean and our stories are different in that i had serious relationships where i was monogamous so obviously the the clock stops but it's nevertheless yeah. i mean that's a massive amount of chick because because that's the end result right that the, the the, the attrition I, rate from the top of the filter. Is yeah, huge. I tracked. I tracked it exactly. Yeah, ask your question. I, I can tell you the the stats on how it progressed. But yeah, but but just quickly, the the question though is, um, what was my question? I mean, now that do you, where do you go from here? I guess is a question. That's that's why. <laughs> to me, four is like that's why I'm kind of scaling the business now. Is I'm trying to like help as many guys as possible. Like like the digital product that I built, I spent like three years on it. And I tried to put in every, I call it Occam's razor. So it's the most, you're a physics major. It's uh, the most simplest solution without, you know, being any simpler. So I'm giving the core things of the game without, with, while being as concise as possible without giving anything superfluous. And speaking of England, there was, there was a guy that hit me up in January. He bought the product in June of 2018. So last year as a virgin, and he got up to 47 by January. And I, I've never met the dude. I've never trained the dude. And so um, I'm trying, yeah. I've, I've seen, and I've seen stuff like that a whole bunch of times. And that's just from the digital, digital products. When I'm in person, I can, you know, calibrate them in real time and fix things a lot faster. So now I'm, I'm basically scouring the globe for the top underground guys and I'm hiring and they have to have, you know, some experience. Basically, are they really good at game? And can that be verified by a bunch of different factors? Um, do they have experience coaching and are they really passionate and driven about this stuff? And I'm trying to provide the best offering in the business now. Um, and like I told you before, it's not just about night game and day game anymore. I want to make it like total man optimization. Like the guys have to have their alpha mindsets on track, their fashion and style, their just, just becoming a full, well-rounded man. Is I the product to... off? Is is the product available already? Or... Yep. Send me after we're done. Send me a, on Facebook a link. To, I'd like to look at the sales. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to see it. Yeah, sure. Cool. And my method, a lot of people have equated it to almost like Jordan Belfort's straight line persuasion system. I never, I never went through that system, the sales training, but I had a top sales trainer that took my program. He was like, this is Jordan Belfort's straight line. Like you said, like you're moving, the, you're moving it through the funnel as fast as possible. You know, the points where it can diverge and you know how to bring it back to the straight line and move it forward again on those key critical points. And that, that's what I train on. I focus most of the training on here's the key elements at a high level structure to move it forward. When this happens, you do this. When this happens, you do this. And you're also making a real-time probabilistic assessment at all points of what are, what's the chances this will close and how long will it take. And if not, how can I frame this for a meetup at a later time the, the fastest way possible? Um, cool. But yeah, with the, with the stats, like it took me uh, about 10 years to hit the first 100 because I lost my virginity in 2002. And then I hit the first 100 in 2012. And then it was like 80 the next year. And then it started getting to be around 100 a year. And then it was like 143 in 2015. And I was like, there's no way I'll ever beat that. And then it was 245 from July 17 to July 18. And it's from all these little 245. So that's almost a girl a day. Yeah. And that's just closes. Like I don't track the, the non-sex hookup. So if like the chick 
if it's like a blowjob or hand job, I don't count that towards the score, so to speak. It's almost like not even. Oh my God, you're superhuman in that. I mean, even just to 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 fulfill those ejaculations, or basically to show up, <laughs> you got it. You got you're constantly I, on it, huh? I take uh, what was it, maca, the 500 milligram maca. No, but basically that was a joke. But but basically yeah, yeah. you're. If you're not interviewing me or working on your business, you must be on top of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the time. I, I tell guys like, imagine not having a job, and then all your time is either working leads over text, being on a date, or fucking like either a rotation girl or, or from a yeah, date. That was that. That was how I found it. I mean, at the or acquiring new leads. Acquiring it's new all leads. to do this well, you need to be fully immersed. But it's yeah. quite a thrilling experience for a bit. Yeah, yeah but, but, but it takes over. I don't know if it's the health. Like you said, it's not the healthiest thing like you know when the dust settles you're like yeah, it's like, <laughs> like what next like i i track that exactly i have a whole bunch of guys coming at me in the community i've been reporting it for like seven years with like exact graphs and stuff and i have you know over 100 polls on camera on infield and stuff like that and i i was i posted like 300 of the chicks on instagram with their faces blurred in a row but guys are still like it's it's it sounds so crazy now like when i hit 150 back in in early 2013 guys were like oh no that's bullshit and I was, I was, you know, describing this stuff in detail. And as it's gotten out to a thousand, a lot of guys are like, no, it's, it has to be fake. It has, a lot of people are saying it's all hookers now, which doesn't even make much sense. Um, but yeah, let me, let the me. The question let me, for you or for that I faced and maybe you'll face is I, I had a, it wasn't as big, but I had a catalog and it was impressive, but I, I kind of looked at the next 10 years of my life and I said to double or triple or quadruple my catalog between 35 and 45 is that a good use of my life for me Probably i not. concluded no <laughs> so i switched gears but it's it's interesting where where you what a guy has to think about i'd be because curious to talk to you offline about the switching gears part because i mean that i have to basically make that decision like am i gonna just be the bachelor for for 10 more years or am i gonna you know because like you look good you... i mean 10 years at the 45 you could still i mean it, it could be a solid solid decade you know but the question is then then what? Then you're sort of at 45 trying to figure out, we can talk about this offline, but figure out the next move. But then you're very ingrained, even more so in the lifestyle. So I got to wrap up one more question before we talk. Okay. We yeah. yeah. So time, man. I want to, I wanted to get into your, your offering that, cause we're going to put the link in the description guys. Yeah. I'll tell you quickly. It's called, it, the business is called no man left behind. Mm -hmm. And it basically, it's 12 week course. It, the first, there's a new offering that you'll love. The first six weeks are, <clears throat> Um, a distillation of my old material about meeting girls, stuff we've talked about, how to set up the date, get sex, keynote, closing, all that. But I have a new, a new piece of technology I developed with one of my autistic clients, believe it or not, because he was kept, he was doing everything right, but it just wasn't working for him. So I broke down his game into micro nodes every single step of the way. And I came up with this piece of technology called decision node theory. And what you do is you look, I look at every single node from like first visual contact of the girl all the way to sex. And, mm -hmm. and I break it down and we, we go in depth on what the guy is doing right or wrong and why. Because a lot of guys rush past to know when the first one's broken and the girl doesn't convert. And he thinks it's something later, but actually. So it's kind of like an extreme analysis of every piece. Yeah, yeah. And then that's the first six weeks. And then the second six weeks is all about my later life, which is. Um, I, I talk about the top 10 reasons to get out of the game, how to think about the difference between a wife and mother. Can guys, the, uh, sorry to interrupt, can guys find that online if they search for the top 10? Uh, top 10? I'll send you a copy of it. You can post it. Um, yeah, we can post the link. Yeah, sure. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know if it's available. And then um, the stuff like the difference between a girlfriend, the, the, the screening criteria for a girlfriend versus the screening criteria for a, for a wife or the mother of your kid. And then I talk about how to think about and select for a wife for longevity. And then yeah. f five steps to the altar to think about marriage or, or essentially a long-term commitment. And then what marriage is like and fatherhood from my experience. So I basically more mature men who are thinking about getting off the merry go round. How do they, cause there's so many girls out there. How do you narrow it down to a prospect that you actually have a happy marriage? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the stuff, the titillating stuff that steers us into sex is actually almost antithetical to how you should be screening for a wife. So I yeah. go through that in depth. And the, the this course is, is called uh, Playboy to Papa because I was okay. a playboy and now I'm a father. Yeah. And what's the, what's the website for that? 
It's hosted on Teachable. I'll send you a link. You probably best yeah. to post the link. Yeah, yeah, we'll post we'll post the link below. Make sure you guys check out that link below. Um, one super, I know you gotta go. One super super quick thing because I was curious. We talked about this offline, but for your your close ratio, you said about ten percent, right? Eleven. Per, I think one out of nine girls, strictly speaking, for basically out of nine phone numbers. Mm -hmm. One of them I would have intercourse with. Yeah, yeah. But I was getting nine numbers a day, so it was you know, fun. It was a, yeah the same because I have uh, I have over ten thousand contacts now. Around the time that I had a thousand, I had just hit ten thousand contacts. So ten percent. So, like, so it's like yeah, we're hitting right. And my but friend you tell, you, go ahead. Ahead. I was gonna say, you tell guys that, and they're like, oh, that seems really low. And most coaches are claiming that they're closing almost all the girls, but that's that's the real stats. Is 10%. yeah, I, I, I two other. Pretty prolific playboys have confirmed that. My friend Jeff, who slept over with over 500 girls, and he also had a 10% close rate. And another guy in the community. In other words, if the guy's honest and he's doing real numbers and real girls, 10, 11% is pretty much the best you can hope for because yep. there's so much variables you can't control. You know? Out of your control, exactly. Same thing with sales. Like you're doing door to door sales or cold calling, you're not closing every single door you knock. You know, they get a few closes a day, and that's... Well, well, guys don't realize, though, if you're talking to five or ten girls a day, it's plenty of action. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I tell, I tell guys, if you're, yeah, if you're meeting like 30 to 50 girls in a week, and you close two of them, that's 100 girls a year. Yeah, that's fun. So, yeah, I appreciate, right. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I wanted to ask you about why you chose day game over night game, because I'm a big night game guy, but I don't know if, I don't know if we have time or 10 seconds. Mostly because I don't drink, and I don't uh, I didn't want to stay up super late, and it... it I don't know. I, I, I like the under the radar approach in day game. You can see the girl's body. She's not suspecting it and they can play with it a little bit more. I mean, at a, in a nightclub, every girl, they know what you're talking to them for. I mean, I, yeah. I pulled, I pulled a fair amount of hot girls out of clubs, but it just suited my lifestyle better. And New York is a walk in city. So I'd be walking at three in the afternoon and there are a lot of hot girls. It just made sense to talk to them then. Mm -hmm. So cool. Thank you All so right, much, John. Paul. Good to Make talk sure you guys to. check out the link in the, the bio. We might have to do a, uh in-person follow-on when I'm in London. If, Absolutely, if you're I'm here, so let me know. Is it, you're like, uh, you're like the OG equivalent of, of you know, I'm, I'm like uh, your, your younger prodigy here in terms of, I'm, I'm like a huge analytics guy. All this stuff that you said about sales funnels and, and building it down the It resonates, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's, well, that's the, exactly the how student, I look at it. The student has outdone the, outdone the teacher in this case. So yeah. kudos to you. And uh, yeah, let's link up when you come through. Cool. Sounds good, man. Thanks again for your time. Appreciate it. Yeah. Jenk, everybody. One. Make sure you check out uh, what, what were your books? We'll put those links in the description. Attraction Formula and Getting Late in NYC. I'll send you copies. Cool. Oh, I appreciate it. Okay. Sounds good. All Thanks. Right. All right. Take care.